we're going to welcome Monsignor Leonard Pavonka again. And we had talked earlier about Advent. We had talked about Lent. And I thought as we're approaching Easter, it would be a good idea to go ahead and talk a little bit about what the Catholic Church calls the Holy Tridium, which basically just means the three holy days. Three holy days. And so, uh, Monsignor, welcome. How are you this morning? I'm doing fine. And how about you, Deacon? I cannot complain. Now, <laughs> one of the things that uh, is kind of interesting is most Catholics believe that Lent runs from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday, <laughs> and it does not. It, it does actually not. ends on the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. Right. In fact, in fact, you add up the days, we're counting 40 days, and to get the 40 days, you, you, you begin really, I mean, the, way, the reason it's Ash Wednesday and not on a Sunday we start Lent is because you delete the Sundays, and then you count all the other days going 40 days back from Holy Thursday evening. And you wind up with Ash Wednesday. So those three days of Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, the evening of thirty, the evening of Thursday and all day Friday, Saturday, and of course the vigil on Sunday, Saturday evening, are those three days in which we celebrate the greatest event in the life of the church, greatest event. And uh, for us, Easter actually starts on the feast of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday. Right. Right. And so uh, I invite all our listeners to make it a point this year to actually attend all the services. Mm-hmm. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, the veneration of the cross, mm-hmm. and then either the vigil mass on Holy Saturday or Easter Sunday mass mm-hmm. where we celebrate the resurrection. Now, there's something that is kind of interesting. Traditionally, there is two parts to Holy Thursday. We celebrate the Chrism Mass and the institution of the priesthood by the priests presenting themselves to their bishop, but because of logistics, normally in most dioceses, that no longer happens on Holy Thursday. It happens on Tuesday in many of them. It does here in the Austin Diocese, so we celebrate the Chrism Mass. Monsignor, would you tell us a little bit about what happens at a Chrism Mass? Yeah, the reason is really a good point you're making, the reason why most bishops have decided to do the Chrism Mass on a Tuesday, and most dioceses do that, it gives the uh, priest an opportunity to get ready for the Holy Triduum coming up. And plus, they're all there because Tuesday's a good day to get all the priests together. And, and some dioceses, like here in Austin, do... The morning mass, and I know in my diocese, Corpus Christi, we always did an evening mass, and it could also mean for the priest gathering for a meal, or also listening to a talk prior to the chrism mass. The chrism mass itself is awesome because it's celebrating the blessing of the oils by the bishop, the oil of chrism, the oil of the sick, and the oil of the catechumens, and and uh, it's just amazing to celebrate this event, seeing how God is blessing these oils and the Holy Spirit's consecrating these oils so that whenever the priests take them home, and this is where the priests get their oils every year, and and what they're supposed to do, and I'm sure most priests do this, is that the, the oils from last year, then you take all those oils and you literally burn them. You burn them in fire. And then you have new oils for the new year. And so if you have oils in your church, and some of these churches have like little repositories on the wall, you know, you'll see that Father will take those and 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 completely remove those oils and put put fresh oil once the prison mass takes takes place on on Tuesday, and it is an opportunity also besides the oils for the priest to recommit their to their priesthood. Now you would normally do that on Holy Thursday, but because <laughs> that's when Christ instituted the priesthood and when He said, "Do this in memory of Me" to the apostles, but. But, you know, but so to, in order to capture that reality, the church, during the chrism as with the bishop, uh, the bishop asked all the priests to renew their ordination vows. You know, it's kind of like recommitting themselves to their priesthood. And uh, do the deacons out here in Austin, do the deacons also make a promise? Uh, we do that at the uh, diaconate convocation. Gotcha. Okay, good. So they're, they renew their vows too at that moment. Yes. But it's a great way for priests just to realize you know, we've been ordained priests, you know, by the bishop, uh, called to serve the church, and it's a great, it's like, 
any kind of person having an anniversary, and you do have anniversaries of our nation, that's true. But this is an anniversary kind of that we can all as priests embrace and say, we're all priests, let's re- reconfirm our commitment to Jesus and the Catholic Church, et cetera, et cetera. So I really think it's awesome. <clears throat> uh, yes, and um, one of the things that happens at the Chrism Mass is uh, the priests will then receive the new oils that have been blessed, and they take them home to their parish, as you mentioned. And one of the things we do at St. Anthony's is on Holy Thursdays, we have usually people that are going oh, yeah. to be received into the church bring up the new oils, yes, and they're placed uh, on a pedestal and before they're placed in the ambry later on because those oils, the new oils, other than the oil of the sick, will be used at they're at that coming parish. into the church. Right, right. And for them coming into the, In church, the church, too. Yes. And I noticed one of the things that I love that part of, you know, having a service or part of the Mass on Holy Thursday in your parish is to have that distinctly brought out, having people bring up the now blessed oils, the new oils, and present them to the priest, the pastor, and he places them somewhere during the Mass so people can see them. And what, you know, what I used to do at St. Elizabeth was I'd have a little prayer that I would pray and thank God for that oil that's going to be used for anointing the sick, for you know, for baptism, uh, and also for for those receiving of the church with all the catechumens. So each oil has its own distinct uh, purpose and meaning, and that could be brought out as the people see these oils come down the aisle. Yes, because we have an ambry in most yes. churches mm-hmm. where the oil sit. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure most people that come into the church have no idea what that yeah. <laughs> is and why those are there. So this gives an opportunity to accentuate the importance of those oils. Absolutely. They're holy oils. And, and you know, we they're sacred oils. And so, you know, like, for example, when you're, when you're using the oil of chrism, that's for baptism and confirmation and priesthood. Uh, and uh, when a priest is ordained, for example, the bishop will rub that oil on his hands as a sign of, now Jesus is going to work through his hands to bless people and also in the, in the consecration of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Christ will work through the priest to bring out these tremendous miracles. The oil of catechumens is like an oil of sanctification, purification, protection, so that as people study the Catholic faith, the Holy Spirit is guiding and protecting them from Dark, uh, dark understandings or, you know, other bad elements that could be there because we all know that we're in a struggle against the dark forces as Christians. And then you have the oil of the sick, and, you know, that's really important for people because when they get near death or even very ill or about to undergo surgery, they can ask the priest to be anointed. And that sacrament, that oil has, it, it, for one thing, it, it, for a person dying, it'll get them ready for death so that they're more perfectly reconciled to Christ and they're, their faith is strong. They love the Lord and ready to meet the Lord. Also, that sacrament can be used for when you're going through surgery, asking God's protection on that operation, whatever it is. God, to bless that doctor or whatever, whatever they're doing. And then you also have just sometimes old age. Uh, parishes will have anointing of the sick for people that are like of, of old age, uh, sometimes of 60, 65 or older. And anybody that's old age can receive the sacrament for strengthening of their faith. So often we tend to forget that the word salvation is healing, and the mm-hmm. church has always interpreted this as physical and spiritual healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's so important. And uh, by the way, as we're thinking about the Holy Triduum and all these oils and, and how they're connected to the sacraments, um, I want to also point out, uh, I know we, we may be getting there in a minute, but even on Easter Sunday, where it's part of the Triduum, uh, you know, celebrating Christ's resurrection, uh, that's the day Christ established the con- sacrament of confession. So you know, you have priesthood, and then you have uh, you have the, the you know the priesthood, the Eucharist on Holy Thursday, and then confession uh, on Easter Sunday. Right away, three sacraments that He's established this Holy Triduum. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, Jumping forward to Holy Thursday itself. Yes. And one of the interesting things that happens on Holy Thursday in most parishes is washing of the feet. Oh, yeah. And because we are celebrating the institution of 
the priesthood Mm -hmm. on Holy Thursday. Speak a little bit about the importance of the priest washing the feet of members of the congregation. Well, if you read, actually, there's a double dynamic here. Uh, One dynamic is that if you read the Old Testament, you'll find that the priests, when they were serving in the temple, that's the Holy of Holies, that's where God revealed himself to be, and he was invisible, but he had like a little chair that they believe God sat on, (laughs) the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, so no one could go in that room, it was draped by curtains, except a high priest once a year, but, and then around that room they had curtains so no one could get in there. But if our priest was going near that tabernacle area, even in that next room, which would be where the sacrifices took place, you had to wash your feet. So it was part of the priesthood to wash your feet. So that's one dynamic of the washing of the feet. Jesus is washing their feet because these are the new priests of the new covenant. That's what he's doing. Secondly, we have the other dynamic, which is service. Jesus said, I've come to serve, not to be served. So it's appropriate to emphasize either or both at a Friday Thursday Mass. You know, uh, I know I've done washing of feet where I've washed feet of a lot of people, (laughs) you know, just as a symbol of service. And, you know, maybe it's also a sense of humility. You know, we come before God with humility. One of the gestures I have so admired on uh, Pope Francis is uh, he has a tendency to turn his priestly stole into a deacon stole when he washes feet. Wow. And uh, he made the comment just uh, in the last couple of weeks that in order to be a pastor, you have to be a deacon first. Yes. And I think that speaks to what we're just talking about at the washing of the feet, that notion of priest as servant. Right. And I don't think that ever leaves your priesthood. You know, you know, of course, the deacon focuses on service of preaching, but also service of charity. So in whatever way the deacon, and a lot of the times, the deacons have all kinds of ministries in the parish they carry out to serve the parish community. But I think as priests, we never lose that sense of service either. We are, we are ordained priests on the way to the priesthood. That's true. I mean, the deacons on the way to the priesthood. That's true. But we never lose, we should never lose that spirit of service. We're here to serve and, you know, because Christ himself, the great high priest, you know, washing the feet of the apostles. And uh, it's great to ponder that and realize what that really means for all of us. And I think as Christians, it's a good reminder that all of us are called to service, Mm -hmm. that part of that Christian charism is serving one another. And I think Holy Thursday is a good reminder that it's not just the priest. It is as the disciples were told by Jesus, as I have done for you you should do for others. others. That reminder is for all of us. I love that. And then, you know, of course, that Holy Thursday Mass is really a a wonderful experience. I encourage everyone to try to attend the Holy Thursday Mass in your parish. It just is very moving. And, you know, we have this Eucharistic procession because what happens at the end of the Mass is, uh, you know, we we process with Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament at that consecrated at that Mass, and all the tabernacles are empty, and there's a procession to place Jesus in a place distant from the altar, from the from the tabernacle area. It's a sign of, the, of his upcoming death. And uh, in fact, uh, after there's a time of a period after the at the end of the Holy Thursday Mass for people to remain in prayer before Jesus. But then, at some point that night, the temper, the Blessed Sacrament will be taken away, and Jesus can be found nowhere in the church, in the tabernacle, or in the side chapel. Uh, and that's to emphasize his, his his upcoming death, that the only time the church cannot celebrate Mass is Good Friday and Holy Saturday. Of course, we do have the Easter Vigil, which is a Mass, but so it emphasizes the death of Jesus. He died for us. Which brings up a good point uh, that uh, the Saturday evening Mass actually counts for Sunday. Yes. And so uh, this is uh, when we talk about uh, Jesus is three days in the tomb. It's an important reminder that he rose on the third day. Right. It wasn't that he was in the tomb the entire three <laughs> days. And so when we count Easter for us as Catholics, uh, Good Friday, Good Friday, Jesus dies on the cross, right. which is why we have usually the um, a veneration of the cross at three o'clock on Fridays. Yes. So that we have. Uh, the commemoration at the time that Jesus would have died. 
And so he enters the tomb on Good Friday. He lays in the tomb on Saturday. And for Jews, the next day started in the evening. So this is one of the reasons why Holy Saturday right. has to start after dark. Right, right. The Jewish calendar, if you read the book of Genesis, it always says, and there was, uh, there was evening and morning in the first day. So it doesn't say morning and evening. It says evening and morning. So the concept of the day beginning in the evening is a biblical concept. And that's the Catholic Church has embraced it. You know, yes. we now have vigil masses. And for a while there, we had lost it in our history for a time. But the early early Christians had it. It just yes. said as time went on. So Pope Pius XII, I think, brought that back right. where he said, we're going to now start doing the Easter Vigil Mass. And then soon after that, we began to have Sunday Masses on, yes. on Saturday evening. But like one of the things about, I love the, the fact that we have all these rituals, like on Good Friday, we gather, what, at 3 o'clock. Yes. The, that's the hour we believe that Jesus died on the cross I think it's in the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. or one yes. of the Gospels where it says at yes. 3 o'clock he gave up his spirit. So it's like, you know, you ponder that, and when you do the Good Friday service, you know, you, you it's not, we don't worship the cross, but we, we venerate the cross. Right. We come up and kiss the cross. We, we say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for love of me. And, and typically those crosses uh, have their crucifixes with the body of Jesus on them in most in many yes. yes. But the idea is that, that cross, Jesus' death on that cross for all of us brought salvation to the whole world. And I like the commentary from uh, Bishop uh, or Arch uh, Fulton Sheen, Cardinal Fulton Sheen, Bishop Fulton Sheen. Yes. Uh, when he talks about the cr uh, cross and the fact that it is so strange that the cross would become a sign of veneration. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, we come up and we kiss an instrument of torture. Yes. And that in this lies the contradiction of the cross. Yes. That it can be both. Yes. It's like if somebody today were to take an electric chair and walk around carrying an electric chair. Yes. <laughs> you say, those guys are crazy. They're, why would they... Why would they display this this torture Im image of torture? And well, back in those days, crucifixion was a horrible way yes. of dying. It was terrible. And you know, I know I heard some biblical scholars say that you would be nailed to a cross and put on the side road, and everybody look yes. at you, and you would it would take days to die. Yes. And then the birds would come eat your flesh. And it would be something horrible. Yes. And they were displayed publicly to to, to tell people, don't do these crimes, or this is what you're going to face. Well, that's the kind of death Jesus underwent. Yes. And this is what we're remembering on Good Friday, which is why we read the Passion. Right. Uh, and we read John's version John's, on Good Friday mm -hmm. uh, to remind us of what it took to get us to Easter. And Amen. again, this is one of the reasons why we shouldn't skip either Holy Thursday or Good Friday. Right. You should or go to all three of them if you can. Now, obviously, if you can't make the Easter Vigil, try to make Easter Sunday morning, obviously, is part of our obligation. But I love the Easter Vigil. It's, you know, we'll, we'll be getting it in a second, but I love the candlelight service because it's so important about Jesus, the light of the world. And we, and we're, when we're baptized, we get those candles, you know. Yes. Now, on Good Friday, one last thing. So basically, here we are. We're, uh, you know, we're reading the Gospel of John about Jesus' death on the cross for love of us. And then we have the veneration of the cross, and then we have a communion service. And yes. so they do bring out communion for those there to can receive. And there is no mass, but there's a distribution of Holy Communion to remind us that Jesus, who died on Calvary on that Good Friday, now nourishes us with his body and blood. And the Eucharist we re uh, receive on Good Friday is what was blessed or consecrated on Holy Thursday, Holy Thursday. during the Mass. Absolutely. Which... Holy Thursday is so important that when we have Mass on Holy Thursday, we actually have the Gloria. And if you've ever yeah. been, you know, we have been without the Gloria throughout Lent leading up to Holy Thursday. And not only do we have the Gloria, we ring all the bells in the church. Right. It's awesome. <laughs> and talk a little bit about why we do this. What's so great well, on Holy Thursday. Well, it is the it is the Holy Thursday we're celebrating. You know the fact that Jesus established the Mass at the Last Supper. He's getting ready for his 
upcoming death on the cross. And it's like the last hurrah before the passion begins. We're, we're glorifying God with, with ringing the bells and singing the Gloria and everybody just, you know, it's the first time we've heard such joyous music since Lent began. It's like, we're getting ready for it now, folks. Everybody pay attention. We're glorifying God for what Jesus has done for us. And we're going to celebrate that mystery beginning this evening when we prepare tomorrow for Good Friday and then Holy, Holy Saturday. Um, so I, I think it's just, it's like a, a special moment of, it's like kind of similar maybe to Jesus revealing himself to Peter, James, and John on Mount Tabor. You know, that was right before he died. Yes. He went up to the mountain and said, and they re- he revealed to them his glory, and they were just overwhelmed by that. And yet, he, he next in the few day, next few days, he died. <laughs> yes. So it was like God was telling them, yeah, there's going to be a lot of suffering, even for their lives, and but look at the glory to come. This is a yes. taste of what is coming. And, and I, I love it. We've just had the reading of the Transfiguration uh, at the second Sunday of Lent, and the end of that, when it says not, uh, he tells the apostles not to say anything until he rises from the dead. And right. the passage closes with them discussing amongst themselves what rising from the, the dead, dead could possibly <laughs> mean. <laughs> That's true. But we're all disciples, and I think all of us, at some point or another, in our minds, go, "What exactly does rising from the dead mean for us?" Yeah, that's a good question, and you know. We just need to ponder these tremendous mysteries. I've, I've read, you know, in some great spiritual classics where not only are the people that have died, you know, there are some in, there are some in heaven glorifying God right now. They see God face to face in the vision of the beatific vision. Then there are some people that, that they died in charity. They love God, but they were not perfectly purified. They're in purgatory. And then you have the people on earth struggling. The church has always reminded us Don't forget about the people that are praying for you, helping you in heaven, and even in the souls of purgatory. The people in purgatory, are they can't pray for themselves, but they can pray for us. And, of course, we can pray for them, and we can merit for them. We can obtain merits for them through indulgences and things like that. And I think so often, uh, one of the aspects that I've always found interesting about the teaching on purgatory Mm is the idea that, you know, one of the biggest things we struggle with is selfishness. Absolutely. And so I think one of the reasons that the souls in purgatory can't pray for themselves is if that is one of the things that's keeping them, now you're able to pray for others, but not for yourself, which is directing you outward. That's so important. I like that whole notion of you just emphasize Deacon uh, William on this. Um, I mean, Deacon Michael, Michael, uh, on this thing of overcoming self. I mean, there is in the spiritual classics this greatest offense we have against in our relationship with God is pride and selfishness. We want to do it our way. It's got to be my idea, my thing. And that today, by the way, that attitude is pervasive in the yes. world. It has really gotten bad. And, you know, we pastors and priests and bishops need to preach against the effects of that attitude, that it would be totally devastating if you live that life. So by by thinking, by allowing the people in purgatory to pray for others, they're emphasizing it's not about me. It's about giving glory to God through my love of others, through love mm-hmm. of others. Uh, God our Father told Catherine of Siena, I didn't give everybody in the world all the things they need. I created you in such a way that you're going to need each other. Yes. I want you to look at each other as brothers. You're going to need each other in this life. He said, that's the way I created it. So we've got to have that love for neighbor because God has ordained this as a way of living out the spiritual life. It's we, we look at each other's needs. We help each other on the way to the, of the, to the kingdom. Well, if we had all the gifts, then the body of Christ wouldn't be necessary. Right. <laughs> and that's the whole point of the body of Christ. It is only when we work as one that we're the complete body of Christ. And that is because I'm lacking and someone else can fill that lack. Yes, absolutely. And then the whole notion of just putting God in charge, he's the one, in, but he's the communion of love, Father, Son, and Spirit, a communion of love that he created us to share in by making us, making us human beings needing each other, helping each other on the way to his, to his vision in heaven. 
And so it's like God, our Father, wants us to realize, give up your will and say God's will, because God's will is always going to be to benefit your neighbor and, and actually benefit you. The best possible yes. thing that you can do for yourself is do God's will. Yes, because it is in that that God provides us the graces we need to be who he created us to be. I want to say a few more words about the Easter Vigil Service. I know, on, of course, on Good Friday, and by the way, Good Friday and Holy Thursday and Holy Saturday are so important that the church has said there's to be no other sacraments celebrated those days. Yes. No weddings, no funerals, y- you name it. The only thing I think that could be given is if someone's dying, of course, you can mm-hmm. give them anointing yes. and a communion. Um, but pretty much nothing. Why? Because we want to focus on this three-day, what it meant for, for the whole world, the salvation of the world was accomplished by Jesus in this three-day period, especially in his resurrection from the dead. So I just want to emphasize that, that we no other things are permitted. So don't plan your wedding on Holy Saturday. <laughs> Not only that, plan ahead and go to confession before Holy yes. Saturday. Yes. In fact, confessions are heard the week, the, the week getting ready for Holy yes. that Holy Trinity one. Yes. To, you know, now confessions in case of, of need could probably be given, yes. I'm sure, because God yes. wants everybody to be reconciled, but... But I think the main thing is that get ready for holy, that Holy Triduum by, you know, be, being aware of the fact that we're going to focus on this, these services, the, the Mass of the Lord's Supper, Good Friday service, veneration of the cross, and also stations of the cross. Now, yes. uh, even our Holy Father does that in Rome. Yes. So that's something that take place also. Yes. Uh, ours will be at 1.30 at St. Anthony's. We have the kids doing live stations again this oh, wow. year just around our campus this year rather than through the neighborhood. We're going to work our way back to the big one. But uh, that's a good thing to start Good Friday with. Right, and I want to encourage our our audience today, the Stations of the Cross. Now, maybe there might be some people in our our audience that cannot get around too well. If you can't make it to church, maybe. But you can still do Stations at home. You can get a, a Stations of the Cross booklet, and, uh, you know, you can look at a crucifix and then just go over those 14 stations and pray them. And nowadays everything can be found online. So, Amen. That's a, that's a beautiful thing to do. And so we want to emphasize that on Good Friday. Try to make the stations of the cross. The cross. But you're, Even you know, if you're doing it at home. Amen. And then, of course, Sunday, we, this is a big day where we're celebrating Christ's resurrection from the dead. And this is the night of both the candlelight, we call it this candlelight service, is that we light the Easter fire. Yes. We bless the fire. It's like light has come into the world. A fire has come into the world. Yes. <laughs> and so the deacon will light, uh, the priest or deacon will light the Easter candle and carry it in procession in, into the church. Yes. And then once we're inside the church, everybody starts lighting their candles from that one candle. It's like Jesus is spreading his light everywhere in, in, in the world. He shares his light with everybody. And everybody has a lit candle, and the Easter candle is at the altar, and then either the priest or deacon intones the exultet. Yes. And I love the exultet. That's a beautiful prayer of praising God yes. for creating us. And even saying, even though we failed, Adam and Eve failed, yet it led to our redemption to a greater glory than we we would have had just with Adam and Eve. Yes, and uh, one of the lines in the exalted that always stands out to me is, so happy fault of Adam. Yes. (laughs) And, you know, we don't think of it that way. But, again, we would not have had Christ as Savior if Adam had not fallen. Right, and we would not have had this glorified dignity of, you know, you think about it, that Jesus comes to live in us. Jesus, yes. I mean, it's a, a new level of spiritual reality mm-hmm. that Christ brought about that I think was beyond what was we were created to be. It's it's, it's amazing. Uh, the ways of God are amazing. Yes, and uh, it's, you know, the early church talked about it as divinization. That yes. We become holy through this. And yes. this is something, you know, Adam and Eve were in the presence of God but they were not holy. Right. We become holy through Christ. And so that's why the church intones the happy fault of Adam. Right. But so, before we go deeper into yeah. uh, Holy Saturday, um, you mentioned that 
we're talking about preparation. And one of the things that happens usually at the Easter vigil is people coming into the church. Now, one of the things we do at St. Anthony's is we have a retreat on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, If we haven't done uh, the anointing with the oil of catechumens, we do it at the retreat. Normally, we do it during the scrutinies. Mm -hmm. But we're preparing people to receive the sacrament. And actually, we've been doing this all Lent. Right. Because as Christians, that's what we've been doing during Lent. Right. Is preparing ourselves. The church tells us that we're to go to confession at least once a year, preferably during the Easter, uh, the, the Lenten season. Mm-hmm. And we are to receive Holy Communion at least once a year mm-hmm. at Easter. Right. And so we too are receiving the sacraments. Right. And so that preparation is actually for all of us, but particularly for those people coming into the church because Holy Saturday traditionally has been the time when people came into the church. Right. It's beautiful, right? The, or since the Vatican II has called for the re- renewal of the rite of, of catechumenate, uh, it's been uh, re how would I put it, resurrected from our past. <laughs> yes. And uh, we have these beautiful ceremonies, right of election. You know, you're called to go, I want to be a Catholic. Okay, then you you sign a book and you're, you're sent to the bishop to be received by him on this journey of formation. Yes. Beginning of the Lenten season normally, I think, is when it starts. And then you, during the process of formation and the classes and learning, you're anointed with the oil of catechumens because the oil is an indication of, of God enlightening you and protecting you from the evil one. Yes. Because there's nothing worse in the world than to be uh, have confusion called by the evil caused by the evil one. We see a lot of that today. Whenever you see division and confusion, Satan is somehow in it. Yes. He's somehow in it and he wants confusion. He doesn't want us to follow the clear will of God. So the anointing of catechumens protects people. Yes. It gives them that enlightenment to say, "Oh, yeah, this is awesome. God's will is awesome." And and they they more deeply understand it. One of our retired deacons used to, when he was talking about the oil of the catechumens uh, for the people coming into the church, used to say that we apply the oil of catechumens for the same reasons wrestlers in Greece yeah. used to anoint themselves with oil <laughs> so the enemy couldn't get a hold of them. And he said, we do the same thing with the oil of catechumens so the enemy can't get a hold of you anymore. That's a good analogy. I like to have to keep that in mind. <laughs> That's a good point. But uh, yeah, this, so basically then come Holy Saturday and all these people have been formed and this is the last day so make a retreat in the morning and maybe get anointed with all the yes. catechumens because that's already been blessed by the bishop mm-hmm. and then they're prepared for all that beautiful ritual of, of just, and by the way, on Holy, on, on the vigil, the Easter vigil on Holy Saturday night, uh, when they do the readings on yes. that particular mass, there's like, I mean, it's 10 readings you can yes. read, but some... Sometimes the people just do five, but yes. it's a lengthy looking at salvation history. Yes. Adam and Eve, Moses, I mean, Abraham, Moses, all of that is brought into focus. So where did we come from? Yes. Who are we as Christians? Where does where do we go back to based on the Old Testament, you know, the scriptures? Yes. It, and I always thought uh, there was such a nice fit between the exalted and then the readings. Yes. Because the exalted in a way prepares us for now the exposition of salvation history through those readings. Absolutely. And those readings are just emphasizing God's love, God's norms and laws. You know, and let's put it this way. I've, I, I continue to hear people say, well, I don't like laws and rules. I said, you know, if you love someone, you're going to follow certain laws and rules as a sign of your love for that person. Yes. You're not going to offend them. You're not going to steal mm-hmm. from them. You're, you're not going to... Uh, mistreat them. Those are rules. Yes. So wherever there is love, there's rules just by nature. Of course, God's biggest plan, God's biggest rules are the Ten Commandments. And yes. if we, and those Beatitudes, yes, those rules of how to really be happy, you know, that Jesus gave us, are so important. You bring up a wonderful point because I've always seen it the same way because God always presents himself as being in a marriage with the church. And so if you are married... There's going to be rules in your marriage. Absolutely. Rules that you don't actually 
necessarily want to follow, but that's the way your spouse is, and that's the way your spouse thinks things should be done. And at some point, you follow those. At some point, your spouse follows the rules that you came grew up with. Right. And so you follow these things because that is what a relationship is all about. Right. It's a give and take. It's a giving yes. and receiving. And marriage is a tremendous mystery of how God's relationship with us. Yes. You know, it's like God loves us, but he wants us to respond. Yes. It's like we have our role, too. It's not as if God just... Uh, giving blessings to us, throwing blessings on us, and that's it. No, it's a dynamic. And there has to be a constant yes from us. Yes, a response. To that grace. To that grace. And then allowing, this is where the Catholic spirituality is so important, allowing God to change us through these sacraments, especially, you know, the Holy Triduum. God is enlightening us, strengthening us. The, The Mass is Christ's resurrection from the dead in a very powerful way. So that God is is enlightening us, strengthening us. So we're not, we're not. Um, so we we are radically changed by the sacraments. Yes. We are truly made holy. We are divinized. Yes. We're not just a a you know a cow patty covered with snow. No. Uh, <laughs> we are radically changed and and made holy. Yes. Because Jesus has made us holy. See, we we don't deny the fact that save, faith saves us. Yeah, faith and then grace which works in us to make us holy. Yes, and uh, we're down to five minutes, okay. so what we'll need to do is uh, speed up a little bit on okay. Holy Saturday uh, and get to Easter Sunday. So we've talked about the Easter fire and entering of the church. We've talked about the readings. Now uh, we have the Eucharist. Well, we have yeah. people coming into the church, coming, right. and uh, they receive baptism, confirmation, and then they receive the Eucharist. Right. And remember, we have did not have consecration on Friday. Right. Now the tabernacle is empty. Empty. And we bring out the bread and wine on Holy Saturday. Right. And now we have a whole new consecration right. of the body and blood of Christ for the people coming into the church to receive for the first time. And it's so it's so beautiful to see these people that are baptized and then confirmed right after the sermon. Yes. You know, the priest will go down and first of all baptisms, all those baptized. Yes. And and then uh then then for those who are n- baptized non-Catholics, yes. let's say Baptists, Presbyterians and others who are becoming Catholic, they will be then received into the church yes. by the priest. They simply say I confess and believe everything the Catholic Church teaches. You know, so, and that reception then leads to their making their first Holy Communion. Yes. And of course, confirmation following yes. that immediately. And then First Communion, because now we've had no Mass since Holy Thursday, and now we're doing this Eucharist to reestablish, make present Christ's body and blood, soul and divinity through the Eucharistic species. And so it's like, wow, this is what it's all about. And yes. the people that make their First Communion, you know, it's always a mystery. I tell children, when you receive Jesus in communion, you it's just mystery. You know, yes. God, Jesus is changing in ways you can't imagine. Yes. It's a great mystery. It doesn't always mean you're going to feel good. Don't expect feelings, but expect expect the Lord to change you. Yes. As you open your heart to him. Yes. I think one of the things that uh, is so awe-inspiring for me every time I go to the Mass on Holy Saturday is people I would never expect crying the first time they receive Holy Communion. Wow. And it's something that, as cradle Catholics, we don't really experience anymore. And we should. Yeah, you are so true, Deacon, Deacon Mike. So true that, uh, because, you know, I, I think in the last time we did our conversation together, I mentioned that sacraments are not magic. Yes. And I think some Catholics have fallen into the problem of thinking that if I just do this, if I just receive communion, I'll be I'll become holy. Not necessarily. You have to have the proper dispositions when you receive communion. So if your heart is open and you're, you know, like you're in the state of grace, you made a good confession and receiving Jesus and you're saying, Jesus, I want you to work in my soul to make me like you. Uh, Bring about whatever changes and needs so that I can become like you and get closer to you. If you allow the Lord to do that, yeah, that tears and all kinds of things can come. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what communion does to people. And uh, 
That's a great mystery. I just say, have a great love for Jesus in, in Holy Communion. And we're down to the last minute and a half, so I just want to finish up with reminding everyone, if you have never been to the entire Triduum, mm-hmm. make it a point this year to go. And uh, I know Holy Saturday, the Mass is long, but it is well worth going. And uh, as uh, Monsignor was just saying, the graces that we receive in celebrating the sacraments, in receiving the sacraments, are unbelievable. All we have to do is allow them to work in us. Monsignor, as always, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, We're going to come back for part two, but if you would leave us with a blessing. Yes, we ask God's blessing upon all of us as we prepare for the Holy Triduum. May God pour upon us abundant graces and blessings to open our hearts and minds to his tremendous work. May the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the mother of Christ our Savior, who was there at Calvary, uh, sharing her in her son's passion and death. May she who is also, also the mother of, of Christ, the mother the sa- mother of the Savior, the mother of God, wrap her mantle around all of us, and may God's powerful blessing be upon us in the name of the Holy Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.